We are all heart sick at the reports just about every week of another tragic use of firearms to kill innocent people. Someone acts with criminal intent or someone crazy with anger or fear determines to kill himself while taking out his rage on others. And through all of this, we live in a nation that is polarized and paralyzed. We are polarized between those persons who will say that everyone should carry guns because that's the only way we will all be safe. And people who say that no one should carry guns because that is the only way we will all be safe. In the midst of this paralysis, we need to respond positively to the Second Amendment. It is not going to go away. And we have to find some way forward that is in keeping with the spirit and the letter of the Second Amendment and in a way that actually creates greater safety for the whole populace. My name is Mark Robinson. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Creative Conflict Resolution and an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. And I am bringing you this video because I have a proposal to put before the American people that I think is a way that we can move forward that will create greater safety. There are certain things that I think we can all agree are true, or at least most of us will agree are true. And that is that there are certain people who should not be permitted to possess firearms. I'm one of them. I wouldn't be safe with a handgun. I wouldn't choose to carry one, but that's because I don't think I would be safe with it. So I think probably most people are not in a position to carry firearms safely. And as a society, we have to limit because some people will choose to carry a firearm and they are not safe. On the other hand, there are some people who are safe to carry firearms. In fact, there are some people who are required as a part of their vocation to carry a handgun or a firearm of some kind. But there are also private individuals who, because of their love of gun culture, because of their understanding of gun safety, because of their desire to protect themselves and others, are people who should be permitted to carry firearms. Okay. The question is, how do we make that distinction? And who makes that distinction between who may possess firearms and who must not possess firearms? That is the crucial piece. How do we make this choice? Now, to a large degree, what we have done is we have focused on the question of ownership. Who gets to own a gun? And I would first of all suggest to you that we change our focus away from ownership to the question of possession. Who actually has the handgun? Similar to, I can own a car, but I can't drive it unless I have a license and registration and insurance. I may own a gun, but I don't get the right to possess it unless I have demonstrated that I am safe with it. Now, <clears throat> if I may be permitted to slightly paraphrase the um, Second Amendment, putting the operative clause first, which is where I think it belongs, and say that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed because the security of a free state depends upon a well-regulated militia. What we have in currently is that an agreement that the government is not going to be in a position to make the decision about who does have the right and who does not have the right to carry a firearm. And we have instead said that gun dealers have the uh, um, responsibility to make this determination. Now this is pretty much the, uh, the, what is the fox guarding the hen house. Because gun dealers have a financial advantage to determining that anyone who wants to buy a gun is entitled to it. So we should rule out gun dealers as being the ones to make this decision. It seems to me that it properly falls to a kind of organization that we might call a citizen's militia. This term is suggested to me by the action of the Supreme Court in their finding in the a case called D.C. versus Heller in 2008, who looked at the prefatory clause of the Second Amendment and said that for the framers, a militia comprised all males, certainly at the time it was written, it was all males, but all persons physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. This is what a militia is. It is a community of people capable of and acting in concert for the common defense. 
And this right to individual ownership was necessary, said the Supreme Court, so that the ideal of a citizen's militia would be preserved. So the idea already exists in the mind of the Supreme Court, but it doesn't exist as an entity in, in our um, American law. So if the Congress were to create a citizen's militia, I'm suggesting that its responsibilities be that the militia knows who its members are, can verify their identity, can certify which firearms they are able to use safely. Have they had training? Have they been checked to be able to do this well? to know what they possess and that, to verify that they do have lawful ownership and to know their criminal and mental health status to be able to ascertain that these are people who have the temperament to use them responsibly. Now, the benefits to members are that by being a member they have the right to possess firearms, being certified to carry a particular class of firearms, and they gain the status by having become a member, they have been able to demonstrate and certify that they are responsible gun owners. Now, no matter how well the citizens' militias do their job, at some point a member is going to commit a crime with a firearm. Being a militia member, uh, the militia is not criminally liable for the actions of its members. But the militia does have a responsibility to affirm and show that it has been diligent in the fulfillment of its legal obligations. And if the militia is found to have failed in its fiduciary responsibilities, it may be civilly liable. It seems to me that this proposal does match the spirit and the letter of the Second Amendment. Because in summary, what we are doing here is we are saying that by creating a well-regulated militia, and giving it the authority to determine who may and who may not possess a firearm, we elevate the status of its members to that of a protector of the common good. Because making this determination is necessary for the security of a free state. It is for that purpose that the right to keep and bear arms is granted to private persons. To possess such force for any other purpose is criminal and a violation of the safeguards enshrined in the Constitution.